Hello, Spark fans, and welcome back to Advancing Spark. So this week, we're looking at Delta Streaming. And that is our ability to write streaming jobs. So Spark structured streaming, but from a Delta table. And that Delta table might be might be receiving a stream of data. It might be receiving just batch updates, and then we're streaming out of it. And I can have multiple subscribers all looking at that same Delta table saying, just tell me what's changed since I last looked at it. And that can be in real time, that can be in batch as well, which is all sorts of weird, crazy, coolness complaint. So, really cool stuff. Let's kind of have a look at Delta Streaming. If you use this, and if you have any questions, don't forget to pop them in the comments below. And don't forget to like and subscribe, because it really does help us out. Okay. So, on with the show. We have a empty folder. Exciting stuff, right? I've got a flights folder in my leg, so got my root-based flights. Nothing in there currently. So I'm going to run a quick thing inside our Databricks data set. So kind of the built-in sample data sets, so there's flights, which is just a big CSV file. And I'm just pulling that out in two ways. I'm saying just give me the whole thing. Just take the entire data frame, write it out in Delta to this base flights full folder. And do the same, except I've got a limit of 10. It's quite a really small little cut of that data. Just give me a little sample starting copy of that data that I can start with. So that's worked. So we should see now in our folder, we've now got two tables, both Delta. So I've got Delta logs, not a lot of data in there. Okay. Uh, and then doing a quick thing. I just want to register it with Hive so I can write some queries. I can do things with Delta full flights, it's my big table, Delta flights, my small table. And again, we can just see we've got a little bit of data in that particular flights folder. Okay, good. So we've got 10 records, nothing particularly crazy happening there. So I'm gonna do some updates and stuff to that table, but let's stick with that to start with. I've got a straightforward Delta table that has just 10 rows in there. Okay, so switching over. So now I wanna hook something up that's gonna stream from that small Delta table. So how do I do that? Well, I write a data frame where we start with everything. And again, shouldn't call them DF for everything. Bad practice, it's fine. Uh, I'm saying Spark, read stream. So this is a structured streaming query. So if you're not used to streaming, it's the, it looks, the syntax is exactly the same as the normal batch one, except for that spark.read stream. So I'm saying this should be a streaming query, format of Delta. So that tells it it needs to understand that Delta transaction log, tells it it is coming from a Delta source. And I'm giving it that location, that same, my flight's small. So I'm saying I want to, create a new streaming data frame based on that Delta table. And then I'm going to do a little manipulation. So I want to append the timestamp. I want to know when these transaction records are coming through my streaming query. So it's going to go and kind of just add that in. Nothing particularly crazy there. And then I want to do this. I want to write it out. So I'm just giving it that location. I'm saying my stream query is equal to data frame dot write stream. So I'm using write stream. I'm writing it out from a streaming source. It doesn't need to be that read stream, write stream pair. In the format of Delta, yeah, and I'm writing it to another Delta table. I don't have to. Uh, and then I need this. I need a checkpoint file. So when you're using structured streaming, it needs to keep an idea of state. So it needs to know these are the records I've inserted so far. If you think about it from the Delta perspective, and I've got all my different transaction log entries, all the different changes that are happening in Delta, in my source Delta table, this query needs to know, well, I've already read all of these ones. If I go and look at my Delta table, don't read those changes because we've read them. Oh, there's a new transaction log and it needs to know that it's new, that it hasn't seen it before. And it's done by the files inside that checkpoint. So checkpoint, super, super important for managing the state of your data to, uh, Delta table. And then it's saying start and I'm passing it that location. So it's saying right it's there. So actually I'm just using that same location, both for the checkpoint and for the start except I'm creating a subfolder called underscore checkpoint. So in the same way inside a Delta table, you've got that underscore Delta log, which is just all of our different transaction logs. I'm doing the same for the checkpoint. So it's within that same data, data folder, but starting with underscore means it's ignored by Hive. So Spock's just going to ignore that query and we're just going to go through, which is nice. Okay, so I've created my data frame. So it's read out my data. I'm going to quickly do my adding. And then I can say, well, let's just run this, run this streaming query. Again, it is a streaming query. I've not told it how often to run. I've not told it how many times to run. This is just gonna keep permanently going. 
Actually, we'll see this stream initializing. Then it's now started, and we can see our raw data got no input rows. So actually, I pretty missed that first insertion. So the way it's working is as soon as it actually runs, it does some stuff, and then it runs again, and then runs again, and runs again, and runs again, and it keeps running and going. So if we go over here and we just do a quick, let's just go and insert our data. So that's going to go off, insert 10 rows. And we should see in this batch, we'll see at the second batch or the third batch when it comes through, and we'll see a number of rows actually. So we should, we're expecting a little spike of 10 rows. There we go. So we can see 10 rows have gone through. And this is a live query. This is going to keep running, keep looking. That's going to tick. We'll do another batch in a second. That's going to go down to zero again because I'm not making continuous changes to my Delta tape. Okay, so that's another batch kicked off. And I've now got no rows in this particular micro batch. And that's because Spark is a micro batch style streaming service. So if we are streaming, we're not actually doing a continuous record by record thing most of the time, unless we force it to. It is doing a micro batch. So it'll run, it'll do a run, process all the rows it's found. And then when it's finished, it'll kick off another run and find any rows that have happened since then. And in terms of Delta, it's going to look for those transactions. So this is going to keep running, keep going in a circle basically forever until an error happens or they stop my cluster. Uh, and this, for me, in terms of when we talk about that kind of reactive delta streaming, isn't the greatest of patterns. Because this means I need to keep my cluster on. So if I'm only updating that delta table every hour, every day, then I've got something that's permanently turned on waiting for it to happen. And it doesn't need to be. So let's turn it off. Let's say, okay, that's enough. I've, I can see I'm, I can do a live query. If I have to have a live query, I can do it. That's great. Let's cancel it. So I can say, go away, stop that. What do, I do? what do I do if I only want to run it once? And that's when we can talk about triggers. So I could say, well, in this table, I want the trigger. And at once equals true. So it's going to do one iteration. It's going to do one cycle of saying, what's changed in the Delta table since I last ran? And again, in the checkpoint, it knows when it last ran and what version of the Delta table it used. So I can run this. I've not added any data. So it's going to be super quick and go, there's no data. It's, there we go. So nothing happened, no input rows, nothing's going on. I can come back. I can make this change. So I can say, we'll add another 10 random rows into my table. And then I come back and I run this again. So a change has happened to my Delta table since I last ran. So it's going to go in, evaluate the state of the Delta transaction log compared to the checkpoints and say, was there anything to do? Yes, there was. Okay, I've now got 10 rows that's going through. So you can see this batch ID isn't actually going up when I was running once I had zero rows. It's only going to increment that when it finds things to do. So if we run it again, we should then see it's gone up to batch three and it has zero rows again. So we get this idea of what was the batch, how many rows were in that batch, how many times it ran, what was the starting position and ending position of that delta table. And we get lots of stuff in there. So there we go. So we're in batch three, but again, zero rows, and we can keep running that and I'll stay at zero. So this raw data is super useful in terms of understanding what's going on inside there. So we can see it knows it was a Delta table. So it knows it's coming from that, that Delta source. It has this idea of this reservoir version, which is kind of related to the Delta transaction log. It's kind of has an idea of how many changes had happened in the Delta table since it last ran. In this case, there were no changes. So the starting ending points are the same. So let's just run over here. And if we do this, twice. So we're not just doing one change. We're going to say multiple different changes have happened to the Delta table since I last ran my streaming query. And we can go in and we can have a play with this. We can run it a few times. It shouldn't be this slow to insert 10 rows, but you know, things, Delta, who knows what Spark's doing in the background at the moment. Let's think about some stuff. That's going to go and update my table. And then we can run it again. And then we should expect when we actually sort of come into our streaming query, we should see it's not just going from one Delta version to the next one incrementally, it's doing a couple. It's getting all the changes that have happened in a period. And that hopefully is going to just like some ideas going, wait, so I can just run this, I can run this daily, and it'll just say anything that's happened to this Delta table this day, and it'll just group all those changes up. So again, we should be expecting to see 20 rows. So it's a single batch. It's grouped together all of those changes into a single streaming batch. And we can see in our reservoir version, we're going from version four to version six. 
So we can see we've got two changes to that delta table, which are encapsulated in this single stream, which is awesome. So essentially, I can turn this on, I can run this once an hour, and I'll just say, have there been any changes to this delta table in the last hour? If so, grab them and apply them over here. And run it every day. And rather than have to do like complex date passing logic, or have to query it and filter on where my change date is between this kind of CDC style thing, I can just get, give me any changes. And this is Delta. So obviously there might be some big changes that have. And that can cause a bit of confusion. So in this case, let's do an update. Let's go, I wanna, so LAX, do we have that? I think we did. Yeah, so we're origin at LAX. It's gonna change it to one, do an update. So it's gonna go and change that data. And that's not gonna change all records, it's gonna change some of the records. Um, and then what we see if we try and run this, it's gonna get very confused, because that's a change. That is a delta update. It's not just a straight append. And so it's gonna give us an error and say, well, the, there was an update, that's, that's not right. Um, so what we can do is just say, rather than trying to pass updates, and again, says it's not currently supported, which is hopefully a good sign that it's gonna be supported, um, we can do this option, uh, ignore changes. Then put that through. And that changes how it works with change data. So we should actually see all the new data that's come in actually now come in as a batch. So we've got some records come in because of how many, how many of those files were hit by that change. And it's gonna resend all of those records. Um, so we have to make sure we can process it. We have to make sure we can pass. Well, that one's changed. That one hasn't changed. Well, that one has changed. That one hasn't changed. And in this case, it's just dependent. So I'll have duplicates in my table now because I'm just taking that. Just give me the full file sets that have been affected by this change. And we'll talk about merging in a future video because of that. You can do that. It's really interesting. You can do a stream merge into a Delta table, but that's more than we've got time for today. Okay, so that's, that's some good stuff. I can get that streaming uh, working. Now this whole thing of that raw data is so, so useful, but it's kind of locked away inside this view. And that's what I did with this stream query thing. And that, that syntax might look a bit weird. So essentially I'm saying this whole right action, I wanna act as a query. So I can actually just take that out. If I wrote that, that is completely standard, normal Spark syntax, right? saying data frame, not write, go write my data somewhere, and it happens. What I'm doing is I'm saying, I want this action, this Spark action, to actually be encapsulated as this variable. So if I can go and have a look at it, I can say, well, what is that stream query? And I can see that is gonna be a Spark query. So it is a PySpark to SQL streaming, streaming query object. So it's actually sort of an object itself, which I can interrogate. I can say, well, what's going on inside that particular object? Um, I can see all the different things. Like, so I can say, I can wait. So normally if you kick off streaming query and then run some other stuff, it'll just continue with the rest of your notebook. Whereas if I want things to just stop and wait and then tell me what's going on, I can do that. That, that one, recent progress, super, super useful. I've got that next one down. I can say, well, just tell me what last happened in this stream query and then that should look familiar. That's that same output that I had in the last one. So that's really, really good in that I can actually then get some of these metrics. So I can say, well, actually give me the best record in there. And then I want to bring out the num input rows. Um, and I can start to interrogate what was going on inside that query. So if I want to capture metrics from this whole del data stream, a Delta stream, I can do. So really, really, really cool stuff happening in there. Okay, so some other stuff that's going on. So that I've got lots and lots of changes in my Delta table now. I've been doing lots of kind of small incremental things. And it, the only reason it's not pulling those back is because of that checkpoint. So if we go back, we can have a look at this stream. So I've got my streaming Delta. I can see this checkpoint building up and building up the various bits of metadata in there. And actually we can delete that. We can say we'll get rid of that checkpoint, pretend I've not done that before. That's gonna reset the state. So essentially it's gonna say, well, I've not read any of my Delta table before. So we're actually expecting it to go and go back to the very, very start of that and bring everything in. It's gonna be like a fairly chunky, we're expecting, I don't know how many times we run it, 50, 60, 70 rows, something like that. So what are we getting in? Okay, we're getting 50 rows in. We should be able to see, okay, so there we go. 
So start offset, not so it's starting at the beginning and it's gonna end at version six. That's bringing in the full state of my Delta table again, because it didn't know where to start from. And what, that's one of the things that they've just actually um, implemented is this whole thing called the starting version. So if we do that again, if I said, well, I didn't want that, I only wanted the change since version five, since version four, something like that. Um, we can force it to do that. So let's get rid of that checkpoint again. Whoops. Let's get rid of that. And then in our stream, when we're in our, I think we can add a starting version. I think it's start version, might be starting version. Um, okay, and let's just say version four. Let's see what we get with that. Might be starting, we will find out. Okay, so this should actually pick up rather than going right from very start to 50. Oh, no, I think it was starting. Yeah, so it didn't have a start offset. Okay, let's do that again. Get rid of my checkpoint again. And this is something that literally just came in in 7.3. So it's kind of a brand new being able to actually say on a Delta stream where you want it to start from in terms of that stream. Did I get that right? So let's find out. 40, there we go. So we can now see we have this slightly different starting point because we're not saying this is the checkpoint start from. We're saying this is the version in that Delta table to go back and start our querying from. And that just gives us that flexibility. So we can do, I mean, so you can do things like this and we can say, um, you might be familiar with, you know, describe history and Delta dot flights. So we can say, well, actually just tell me my different versions that I'm pulling from. So this is saying, well, actually, I only want to go from there. I want to bring those changes through. Um, so I can actually see if I can use this to decide it. But actually, one thing that a lot of people don't know is that's just a SQL query, right? So I can do things like I can do um, my history data frame is spark.sql. And then I can say, well, that's that. And that's going to treat it as a data frame. Um, so I can just do then things like first. So, and that's going to say, well, get me the most, like get me the top record from my history. Uh, and then I can just then say, uh, I think I can do this. I could say, I want a version. So I'm interrogating the first row in my thing What's my current version? And then I could plug that into my stream query and just say, just give me the most recent version. So because we've got the hit access to that historical table, because we can query it and interrogate that historical table, and because we've now got that starting version, I can just have this rolling saying, give me the current version minus one. Give me the version that's happened since that timestamp. To be fair, I can be starting timestamp and actually give it some uh, other stuff in there. But we've got so many options that we can work with now that we can plumb together into a nice, good, fairly easy um, streaming query. Now, there are complexities in streaming, don't get me wrong. Doing this as a batch query and just saying, select this data, do all my normal Spark manipulation, write it over there, is easier than doing it as a streaming query. If you're doing it in stream, you need to be careful about the state of Things like dedupe and things like joining tables, there's limits to how you can join things when you're doing a stream because it expects it to be this big real-time mess of data. And if it's just received a record and then it's got another stream data set, can you join them or do you have to timestamp it? Do you need windows but within which you can join things? There's a load of complexity there. But if you're just doing something fairly straightforward with a kind of a one-to-one -one mapping of saying, there's data landed, I want to pick that data up and do some cleaning and then put it down somewhere else. This is a really nice little pattern just to trigger once, run it occasionally, get some data, pick it up, do some manipulation, put it down again, and it's quite cool. So there are more features coming here. There's more things that we're going to see in this space. It's just the start of Delta streaming, and it's pretty cool. So hopefully that is useful, and hopefully that is kind of uh, giving you a few ideas about how you can look at your ETL and then plumb it in in different ways and have things triggering in different ways and stop worrying about watermarks and dependencies and CDC and all that kind of stuff and just go, just get me anything that's changed. And that is pretty cool. Again, limitations, things that do work, things that don't work. But if you're doing things fairly simply for certain use cases, it's a really nice, neat little pattern. So let us know if you try it. Let us know how you get on with it. Let us know if you find any limitations 
Otherwise, as we said, don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll see you again soon. Cheers.